Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the webinar in our continuous, continuing series on the COVID-19 uh, economy. Um, today is a big day for us. This uh, launches the uh, formation of a new research network at Monash, uh, the International Consortium for Values-Based Governance. And we're kicking it off today with a stellar panel. Um, in particular, today we're giving a, a panel on towards a value-based approach uh, to governance, and we're delighted to have Professor Colin Mayer uh, as uh, our, the first speaker in this series. Uh, Professor Mayer is, of course, uh, the Dean at the Syed School at Oxford and uh, the Peter Moores Professor of Management Studies. Uh, so we're honored to have him here today. In addition, we have Professor Mark Polange, the Provost at Monash University, and Professor Deidre O'Neill uh, from, from Monash University as well in public policy. Uh, so welcome to everybody. At this stage, I'd like to just quickly hand it over to Mark. Okay, well, uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Simon, and it's a pleasure to be here to, to also join in welcoming uh, Professor Meyer. I, and it's also, uh, I just want to congratulate everyone who's uh, gathered together uh, to form this consortium for values-based governance, and I'm, I'm happy to be part of this opening. So this uh, international consortium examines governance in the, in the institutional context. It advocates values-based governance as a necessary substitute to the one-size-fits-all approach that has dominated governance research, practice, and policy. The interaction between culture and governance is a necessary way forward to address the challenges that have permeated society. So for example, the establishment of the Banking Royal Commission in Australia in 2017 by the Australian government to inquire into and report on misconduct in the banking and financial services industry followed revelations of a, in the media of a culture of greed within several Australian financial institutions. Similarly, and I think appropriate uh, coming from <laughs> Australia, in a review of Cricket Australia's culture and governance, the arrogant and win at all costs culture of Cricket Australia was highlighted as the catalyst behind the ball tampering scandal in South Africa. These occurrences led the Australian Stock Exchange's Corporate Governance Council to provide updated guidance for ASX listed companies reporting on corporate governance. The ASX now requires listed companies to instill and continually reinforce a culture of acting lawfully, ethically, and in a socially responsible manner. This includes companies stating their core values and notifying their boards of materials, material concerns regarding culture. And so today, uh, to stimulate our thinking along these lines, we are honored to have our speaker, Professor Colin Mayer. Professor Colin Mayer is the Peter Moores Professor of Management Studies at the University of Oxford. He is a professorial fellow of Wadham College, Oxford, and an honorary fellow of Oriel College and St. Anne's College, Oxford. He is a member of the UK Competition Appeal Tribunal, the UK Government Natural Capital Committee, and the International Advisory Board of the Securities and Exchange Board of India. Professor Mayer is an expert on all aspects of corporate finance, governance, and taxation, the regulation of financial institutions, and the role of the corporation in contemporary society. He has served on many editorial boards, and he has, uh, among other things, has been the founding editor of the Oxford Review of Economic Policy and the founding co-editor of the Re Review of Finance. And so um, I'm really happy to, to welcome Professor Meyer again to Monash University. And Professor Meyer actually gave a very uh, thought-provoking talk titled The Future of the Corporation Next Steps at an event hosted by the Center for Commercial Law and Regulatory Studies at the Faculty of Law at Monash University in 
in 2019. So we look forward to Professor Meyer's talk. And now I believe I have the formal pleasure of handing the Zoom screen over, Professor Meyer. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mark and Simon, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to uh, deliver this uh, first lecture in the series. And perhaps I can just begin by congratulating you and uh, Krista Karuna in particular uh, on establishing this international consortium for values-based governance. It's an extremely important initiative and it comes at a vital stage in the debate when there is a need for research in this area that really helps to inform policy formulation. So I uh, welcome this initiative and congratulate you on having uh, initiated it. The uh, uh, consortium is concerned with one of the most important institutions in our lives. It's an institution that clothes, feeds and houses us, that employs us and invests our savings. It's the source of economic prosperity and the growth of nations around the world. But at the same time, business has been a cause of increasing environmental degradation, social inequality, social exclusion, and mistrust. And underpinning that is the notion of why business exists, what it's there to do, why it's created, its raison d'etre, what is referred to increasingly as the purpose of business. The current concept of the purpose of business has its origins in the work of Milton Friedman back in the 1960s and early 1970s, when he said that there is one and only one social purpose of business to increase profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game. Now that notion of the purpose of business has been extremely influential in terms of the way in which we think about business leadership, business policy, and business education around the world. But things are changing. There has been, in particular, over the last year and a half, a steadily changing idea around what the purpose of business is. In January 2019, Larry Fink, the CEO and president of the largest investment management business in the world, BlackRock, said that every business needs to have a purpose, not a strap line or a marketing campaign, but a statement of its fundamental reason for being. Purpose, he said, is not the sole pursuit of profits, but the animating force for achieving them. And in August 2019, the Business Roundtable in the US jettisoned its 1997 notion of corporate purpose as being about shareholder primacy in favor of one that emphasized the importance of purpose in terms of delivering value to customers, investing in employees, supporting suppliers, caring for communities and the environment, and creating long-term value for shareholders. And in the autumn of last year, the Financial Times launched its new agenda campaign on capitalism time for a reset. And in January of this year, the World Economic Forum at Davos was on the universal declaration of the purpose of the company in the fourth industrial revolution. So there was an immense amount of momentum in the direction of shifting towards a broader notion of purpose beyond that expounded by Milton Friedman before the coronavirus pandemic struck. But since then, the significance of purpose has gained increasing relevance and importance. 
And the reason for that is that purpose provides a very clear notion of how companies should think about the difficult trade-offs that they have to make during the crisis in terms of enforcing the interests of their employees as against their customers through, for example, cutting costs for their most disadvantaged uh, consumers in terms of promoting products for society in the form of ventilators, tracing, testing equipment, treatments and vaccinations for coronavirus as against maintaining their dividends for pensioners, for example, who may be dependent on them. Now, what a purpose does, and in particular the associated values of a business, is to emphasize how companies should be making those difficult trade-offs and where their real priorities lie in making them. But even more significantly, the notion of a corporate purpose provides a clear guideline to companies as to how they should be uh, coming out of this crisis. Our preferences as consumers, as employees, as societies are changing a great deal in terms of the things we want to purchase, the way we want to spend our leisure time, the way we communicate with each other, how we want to work, and how as societies we want to create sense of community. Now that offers immense opportunities as well as challenges to companies in terms of how they should be investing to promote their businesses going forward. But in particular, the notion of a corporate purpose guides companies not only in terms of what they should be doing, but how they should be doing it in terms of creating value propositions for their investors, as well as delivering real benefits for their customers, employees, and societies. Now this is particularly important given the immense amount of support that governments around the world have provided to their businesses to bail them out of coronavirus. There was a notion that was beginning to emerge before the crisis that business was becoming bigger than government. And while government depended on business, uh, that was not so much the case the other way around. And in many cases, it was observed that businesses had indeed grown larger than some countries around the world, at least in terms of their revenues. But that uh, idea has been firmly put to rest by coronavirus and the immense dependency that has emerged of business on governments to support them and to help ensure that they can survive the types of crises that we're currently observing. Now that support from government in the form of loans, grants, tax breaks, etc., has come on the back of a great deal of public support for it, recognizing the need to ensure that business is able to survive the current problems. But that public support comes on the basis of essentially a reciprocal expectation that business will help economies and societies to come out of the crisis and to do so in a way that not only benefits businesses themselves and those who run and own them, but also benefits societies as a whole in terms of us as employees, customers and communities. In other words, there's an expectation that businesses will support their stakeholders as well as just their shareholders in terms of the leading that recovery. Now, that same public support was present during the 
start of the financial crisis when it was recognized that it was critically important to avoid wholesale collapse of financial systems around the world. But that support for the bailout of banks quickly evaporated when it was realized that actually banks were not rallying to the uh, financial support that they were receiving through recognizing their social license to operate. And the public support then quickly turned to derision. Now it's critically important that business does not make the same mistake this time round, because the consequences of doing that will be much more severe in terms of the ramifications for regulation and control of <clears throat> business <coughs> around the world than it was after the financial crisis. Now critical then to avoiding a similar mistake being made is for business to recognize its purpose and the importance of promoting a purpose that goes beyond just the Milton Friedman notion of increasing profits for shareholders so long as companies stay within the rules of the game. And the notion of purpose is moved beyond questions of whether and why companies should be adopting a corporate purpose to an understanding of what and how. What does one exactly mean by a company purpose and how should companies set about embedding it in their businesses? Now, as I set out at the beginning, the notion of a company purpose is about the reason a business is created, why it exists, uh, it's raison d'etre, it's very fundamental to the notion of a business. It's essentially an idea of what the North Star of a company is, where it should be seeking to go or what it is seeking to become. Now, the notion of purpose that business needs to recognize then not only goes beyond the idea that business is simply there to produce profits, but to a recognition that business is there to do things that even go beyond the idea of simply producing products. That business is really there to solve problems, to solve the problems that we as individuals and societies and the natural world face uh, on our planet and that business needs to find ways of solving those problems not in a philanthropic sense but in a commercially viable way that is financially profitable and sustainable over the long term and that is the challenge that business faces in terms of uh, identifying commercially viable ways of solving our problems. And so the way in which I define the notion of a corporate purpose is that it's about producing profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet. And there's a second part to the notion of a purpose of business, and that is that business should not profit from producing problems for people or planet. Now, what that suggests then is that profit is not a purpose of business as such. It's a product of a purpose and that the profit is produced by defining an appropriate purpose and ensuring the implementation of that purpose. And that notion of purpose that I've just defined in terms of solving problems is not vague or woolly. It's precise about what business, what problems a business is seeking to solve, for whom, how it's going to solve those problems, and when it's going to solve those problems. It is not just 
a mission statement, a mission statement about what a company does. It's not simply descriptive of what products a company produces, nor is it simply a vision statement of what a company aspires to do in terms of saving the world. It's this precise notion of companies being there to solve problems profitably. Now, I want to just illustrate this in relation to one particular company that uh, went through the process of trying to identify its purpose uh, and change the notion of what its purpose was in the process of doing that. The company is the Danish pharmaceutical company, Novo Nordisk, which produces, pharmaceutical, uh, which produces insulin in uh, treating type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes uh, is found a world, uh, around the world, but 85% of it is observed in low and middle income countries, many of which could not afford to purchase the insulin products that Novo Nordisk was producing. So it started off by believing that its purpose was to produce insulin and to do so as efficiently and effectively as possible. But then it realized that actually its purpose was not simply to produce insulin, but to help treat type 2 diabetes for people that had uh, that, uh, that problem. And so it started working with hospitals, doctors, and universities around the world to identify the best forms of treating type 2 diabetes. And then it realized, well, actually, its purpose was not simply to identify the best treatments for type 2 diabetes, which might involve taking insulin, but in many cases did not. It was actually to help people avoid getting type 2 diabetes at all. So it then started working with governments, with local authorities, with health workers around the world to identify the changes in lifestyles that were required to help people avoid getting type 2 diabetes at all. And now its notion of its purpose is about eradicating type 2 diabetes around the world. Now you might say, well, that's all very worthy, uh, but does it not undermine Novo Nordisk's fundamental business model? And the answer is no. It did exactly the opposite. It has led to a booming business for Novo Nordisk. Why? Because in the process of building those relationships with hospitals, with doctors, with universities, governments, local authorities, health workers, etc., it built up relations of trust. And it became a trusted provider of pharmaceutical products and advice to all of those parties around the world. And on the back of that, its business has really boomed. Now that I think illustrates three things. The first is the importance of having a clear notion of what the purpose of a business is, what problems it is trying to solve and for whom. The second is that once one really identifies that notion of solving problems, it's tremendously inspiring for everyone associated with the organization in terms of uh, giving employees a sense of real meaning and purpose in their lives and in the work that they do, in terms of those who were associated with Novo Nordisk's initiative in terms of trying to treat and eliminate type 2 diabetes around the world. Uh, and in terms of the link that it helped to create with the public sector in terms of 
trying to solve those problems. But the third lesson, I think, is in many respects the most important, and that is the reason why this is the basis for creating such strong commercial performance of business, as well as it helping to solve the problems of us as stakeholders. And the answer to that is that it creates what is perhaps one of the most important assets of business, and that is the trustworthiness of business. And the asset that trustworthiness creates is the trust that other parties can then legitimately have in companies with which they engage as customers, employees, suppliers, or societies. So that notion of identifying a purpose, enacting a purpose, and ensuring that it's fulfilled is something that then creates this very valuable asset of trust that creates immense benefit for companies in terms of having more loyal customers, more engaged employees, more reliable suppliers, more supportive societies and shareholders. And that in turn then gives rise to greater revenues, lower costs, and therefore more profit for companies. Now, for companies to achieve this, it is then obviously critically important, not only that they have a clarity about what their business uh, is and what its real purpose is, but that it succeeds in effectively enacting that purpose and embedding it throughout the organization. And one of the things that we've been doing in Oxford is to uh, work with the chairs, the chairpersons of the boards of some of the largest companies in the world uh, to try and identify how in practice they can really enact purpose in their business. And to do that, we've developed a framework to which we've given the acronym of SCORE, uh, where the five letters of it stand for, first of all, S for to simplify, that is to say to uh, simplify the purpose of a business so that everyone can have real clarity about what that purpose is and to really do the second part of that acronym, namely to connect. Uh, and that notion of connecting is about linking the purpose, not just to a marketing campaign, not to greenwashing or whitewashing, but to connect to the core of the business to its strategy, to its values, uh, and to its culture. And that notion of it being core to the business then moves the agenda around purpose well beyond that of corporate social responsibility, CSR, which dominated the debate from the uh, early part of the 2000s beyond that notion of a corporate responsibility as being something that the business does on it, the, its side. This is a recognition that purpose has to be absolutely core to the way in which a business runs its activities, not that it's simply doing some additional philanthropy to make up for all of the problems that its business might be creating. So, that notion of connecting the purpose to its core functions and therefore making it really a central role uh, of the board of a company in terms of defining the company's purpose and then ensuring that it is firmly enacted in its strategies, its value and culture, that becomes a key function of the board of a firm.
But the connecting, as I'll describe shortly, goes well beyond that in terms of the way in which it should be connected not only with those within the business, but also to those various other parties which the business has to work with in terms of delivering of its purpose, exactly along the lines of what I was describing in relation to Nova Nordisk, working with many other parties around the world in terms of delivering what on its own, it simply was not equipped to do in terms of treating type 2 diabetes or changing people's lifestyles. It simply did not have the expertise uh, or the connections to be able to do that on its own. The third uh, part of the acronym SCORE is about O for ownership and the idea that the purpose of a business has to be owned. Uh, most obviously, uh, it is the responsibility of those who lead a business, the executives, to define that purpose uh, and then to bring it to the board, uh, for the board to support that purpose and to give its official backing to the purpose of the business. But it goes beyond just the uh, role of the executive and the board to obviously also the owners themselves, those who own the shares in a company, uh, and in particular where there are significant block holders who hold substantial blocks of shares in companies, such as families, uh, the state and some uh, companies, that those have a particularly important role to play in terms of the ownership of the purpose. But the notion of ownership goes well beyond that to ownership throughout an organization. And one of the key elements in terms of ownership is that it should be something that everyone in the organization uh, feels, that everybody down from the uh, board to the shop floor should feel that they have their particular slice of the ownership of the purpose of the organization. Uh, and that it's something that has a real meaning to the way in which they are undertaking their activities on a daily basis. The fourth element is about reward, about the way in which the purpose is connected to the reward system in uh, an organization in terms of the incentives of people not just at the top in terms of the board and the executive, uh, but in terms of those throughout the organization. And that emphasizes the importance of measurement and metrics uh, and the idea that uh, in terms of fulfilling a purpose, that that purpose is more than just about the financial performance and the financial capital of a firm, but embraces values that go beyond finance to encompass those that are relevant to uh, the human element of a business, uh, the human assets to societies in relation to the social assets and also to the natural world uh, in terms of natural assets. And it emphasizes the importance of the measurement of those alongside that of financial capital, and I'll come back to that uh, in, in just a bit. The, the final part of SCORE, the E, is about exemplifying. Uh, exemplifying that, uh, that notion of the purpose of the business through narratives and through communication that should come from people uh, uh, at the top. And that notion of exemplifying through narratives is what brings it alive in people's mind. Now, I said that the board should uh, initiate the company purpose, but it should be on the basis of consultation with everyone in the organization so that they do feel a real sense of ownership and that they really do understand what is meant by that purpose of business 
through it being uh, related through narratives and a very effective communication. And that, and that idea of a narrative is also very important in terms of uh, investor relations and communication with those outside as well as within the organization. Now, <clears throat> that then sets out the basis on which one can think about how one uh, effectively ensures that a purpose is enacted in an organization. But there are a whole series of policy requirements that are required to shift us from where we are today to uh, a position in which companies as a whole and investors are really focused on the implementation of that idea of purpose and the values that are associated with it. And uh, the British Academy, which is the UK National Academy of the Humanities and Social Sciences, two and a half years ago, launched a program of research on what is termed the future of the corporation, which is looking at how business needs to reform itself over the coming years to address the environmental, social, uh, and political challenges it faces, as well as the normal economic and um, uh, financial ones. And it brought together academics, policymakers, and business leaders from around the world to identify what was required to bring about that change. And the notion of that emerged was around the importance of purpose and that there were a number of principles that were required to really help to develop uh, corporate purpose as being firmly embedded uh, in business. And in particular, it identified eight principles, or I described them in terms of four pairs of principles that are required to establish uh, purpose as being the fundamental driving force of business. And those four pairs of principles are firstly around law and regulation, secondly on ownership and governance, thirdly on measurement and performance, and fourth on finance and investment. And let me just start off by setting out what the uh, conventional view of each of those is. Um, and that is that law is about promoting the uh, fiduciary responsibilities of directors to uphold the interests of their shareholders. That regulation is about the rules of the game uh, under which companies then operate and the enforcement of those rules. That ownership is about the rights of shareholders, that governance, corporate governance, is about addressing the agency problem of aligning the interests of management with their shareholders, that measurement is about measuring financial performance, and that uh, performance itself is about the profits of a business, that finance is about promoting the interests of investors and that investment is about maximizing the value of their shares in companies. Now that's a very coherent, consistent view of what the, uh, the way in which we should be structuring our financial and corporate sectors around the idea that uh, law, regulation, ownership and governance, measurement, performance and finance and investment are all about promoting shareholder benefits, shareholder returns and shareholder value. Now, if we think about this broader notion of a corporate purpose, then it leads one in a direction of saying that actually we need to think about reform in eight, all eight of those areas. First of all, in relation to company law, or corporate law, that it's not just about the responsibilities of directors 
to their shareholders. It is first and foremost about the responsibility of directors of a company to articulate and then enact the purposes uh, of their organizations and to demonstrate how the constitutions of those corporations are aligned with the delivery of their purposes. And an illustration of that type of uh, corporate law that has been enacted is the Public Benefit Corporation in the United States, which is now associated with more than 35 states in the US, which requires the directors of companies to uphold, to state and then uphold a purpose, a public benefit purpose, as well as to fulfill their commercial functions in delivering returns to shareholders. And if they fail to do so, then the shareholders of a company can seek injunctive relief against the directors for failing to fulfill those uh, public benefits. In relation to regulation, regulation in this context is not simply about the rules of the game and their enforcement, but a recognition of the need to align the purposes of companies with their social licenses to operate in those firms that perform particularly important public functions, what is sometimes termed the commanding heights of the economy, such as utilities, banks, public service companies, infrastructure companies, etc. And in those companies, the public function that they're performing means that their purpose should be one that is closely aligned with the social license to operate. So the role of the regulator is really to promote purposeful regulation, purposeful regulation that identifies the public function, the social license that companies are, should be performing, and then helping companies to ensure that they can deliver on that and that they do deliver on that social license to operate. And that involves, in addition then, to simply promoting the rules of the game and enforcing them in a crime and punishment type way, to recognize the importance of uh, aligning, for example, the culture and values of an organization with those social licenses. Now, the third element is in relation to ownership, where the conventional view about ownership is that it's about the rights of shareholders. What this alternative view suggests is that it's much more than that. It's also about the responsibilities of owners and shareholders to uh, promote and uphold their uh, purposes. And the case of Nova Nordisk actually illustrates this very well insofar as the ownership of uh, Nova Nordisk is one where it is publicly listed on the Danish and New York stock markets and actively traded, but it's also got a dominant shareholder, uh, and that is the Novo Nordisk Foundation. It is what is sometimes termed an industrial foundation-owned firm. That is to say that the company has a foundation, as many companies do, but it's not simply a foundation that gives away money to worthy causes, does that. But in addition, it is also the dominant owner of the company itself. And those industrial foundations are in particular observed in Denmark and in Germany, uh, and they're, they're associated with some of the most successful and large companies in the world alongside Nova Nordisk, Bertelsmann, Bosch, Carlsberg, Ikea, Tata, the Indian conglomerate, are examples of industrial foundation owned firms. Now the importance of those foundations is to um, uh, ensure that the purposes and values that the founders had in establishing those companies are retained in those businesses. And so the boards of the foundations have the role of overseeing the companies and ensuring that they really do 
state and enact the purposes and that the values associated with those purposes are retained and implemented. And that relates to the fourth element, which is the primary focus uh, of this newly established consortium at uh, Monash, and that is around corporate governance. Now, corporate governance, as I said, was primarily viewed as being about solving the agency problem of aligning managerial interests with those of their shareholders. But it's increasingly come to be realized that that is actually not the primary function of corporate governance. The UK, in some respects, led the world uh, in establishing corporate governance codes when in 1992 the Cadbury committee established a uh, committee was established to create a set of principles around corporate governance that then became the basis of corporate governance codes which were adopted by many countries and also by the OECD now that notion of corporate governance that was associated with the Cadbury committee was very much along the lines of the conventional notion of ensuring that companies promoted the uh, financial performance in terms of uh, acting as agents of their shareholders. But two years ago in 2018, the Financial Reporting Council in the UK brought out a new corporate governance code in which it said that the fundamental role of corporate governance was basically about corporate purpose. And the second principle of the corporate governance code says that the board of directors of a firm must establish its purpose, its values and its strategy and ensure that they are aligned and aligned with its culture. Said that the directors of a company must act with integrity, lead by example, and promote the desired cultures in their business. It then went on in the next principle to say that the board of directors must ensure that the company has the resources that are required to deliver on its objectives and to measure its performance by them. Now that summarizes, I think, very well what one means by the notion of values-based governance. And that is to say that the role of the board is to define its purpose and ensure that the strategies and values and culture of a business are aligned with that purpose. It, ensure, it should ensure that the investment that is required to deliver the purpose uh, is provided and it should measure performance of the company against the delivery on its purpose. And that then comes on to the fifth aspect of the policy principles that I was describing, namely measurement, where I've already said that in terms of measurement, one needs to move beyond the notion of just measuring financial and physical capital, but establishing the metrics that are required to uh, de demonstrate delivery of a company's purpose. Now, there are really three aspects to measurement. The first is around the metrics which are required. The second is around valuation. And the third is around accounting in a conventional sense. A lot of the work that's gone on in this area, for example, in relation to environmental, social and governance, factors, ESG, has been around the first of those, namely creating metrics. And there are now a, a very large number of organizations that in one form or another produce metrics on ESG. And some of the most prominent are organizations uh, such as SASB, uh, the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, uh, GRI, uh, at TCFD that produce uh, a, a variety of different ways 
of looking at those metrics for different purposes. So SASB, for example, focuses on what is financially material for a company and relevant therefore to its shareholders, GRI, focuses on stakeholders more generally, TCFD focuses predominantly on carbon uh, emissions. And what all of those are doing then is essentially to try and measure different metrics that are important uh, in terms of promoting purposeful businesses. But there's been an immense amount of confusion around those measures and a high degree of inconsistency because in many cases they lack data verification, standardization, auditing, etc. And it reflects the fact that in many respects they've been supply driven, often by consultancy companies rather than by what companies themselves need and what investors need. So there are attempts now to move beyond that in terms of realizing that first of all we need to have some standardization around at least a small number of metrics that are adopted by all companies around the world and for example the World Economic Forum is working to produce around 22 metrics or so that can then form the standardization uh, of those measures. But there's also a recognition to go beyond that in terms of linking that into uh, the way in which businesses value their activities. And so to think about how does one value things beyond just financial capital? How does one attach uh, values to human, social, and natural assets as well? And in that regard, there's a major initiative that's being undertaken at the Harvard Business School uh, to establish a valuation base of those assets uh, that uses a, as much information as, as is available to produce those valuations. Now that's a very important exercise, but there's a considerable degree of uh, uncertainty that inevitably surrounds the uh, parameters that are required to translate metrics into values. Um, and uh, there's also a need to think about a third way in which one should relate uh, these uh, measures to companies. And that is through more standard types of accounting. And in particular, to think about it, not just in terms of values, but in terms of costs. Because as I described in the second part of my notion of purpose, the purpose of a business is to avoid profiting from producing problems for people and planet. And that's not just a normative statement of what a company should do, but also a statement about how we should measure profits in a very positive way. And the notion of profits there is then to say we should account for the costs of avoiding producing problems and where problems are produced, the cost of cleaning up the mess. And it also means thinking forward in terms of what are the potential problems that might arise in the future. And I'll give you a quick illustration of that. It's quite correctly said that the current pandemic crisis is different from the financial crisis insofar as it was not caused by the corporate sector in the way in which the financial crisis was caused by the banking sector. But in some respects, the consequences of it are a problem of the corporate sector insofar as many companies had financial reserves that amounted to less than three months of their operating expenditures. So one of the reasons why we observe such draconian responses having to be made by businesses around the world in terms of cutting their costs is they simply did not have the level of reserves and provisions that they should have had in terms of ensuring their ability to survive the types of crises that are now being uh, observed, at least for a period of six, if not 12 months. And that would have made a very substantial difference to the resilience of business to this type of crisis. Now, 
That then comes on to the seventh element in terms of finance and the role that investors should play in this and institutional investors in particular, not simply in terms of uh, promoting the interests of their savers, but in recognizing the key role that they have to play in terms of stewarding those savings and those assets in overseeing the way in which they are invested in the corporate sector. So it's a fundamental role of institutional investors to perform a stewardship function in terms of not simply measuring ESG and all of those other factors that have grown in significance, but recognizing their role in encouraging companies to establish a purpose, to define it with the clarity that I described earlier on, and ensuring that they really are embedded in their organizations and that there is appropriate measurement of performance against those purposes. So that function should be a primary function of institutional investors alongside the role that they have to perform in terms of promoting the interests of their savers. And the final element in terms of investment brings out that element of partnership that I was talking about in terms of delivering purposes that means that it's not just about investing to maximize shareholder value. It's about investing in conjunction with the public sector, with the uh, not-for-profit sector, with social enterprises, in terms of delivering on companies' purposes. Because as Novo Nordisk illustrates, one company on its own cannot do that. And it has to be able to work effectively with other organizations in the public sector, in the not-for-profit sector, in terms of delivering on its company's purposes. Now, those eight elements then of law, regulation, ownership, governance, measurement, performance, finance, and investment are what are required to really ensure that companies can deliver on their purposes. If they do so, then they transform the performance of the firms themselves as well as the world in which we are living as individuals, as societies, and the natural world. Because that notion of a purpose is really an inspiring one. We all want to have meaningful, fulfilling jobs and lives. And we want to be supported in delivering on our own individual purposes. And we look to the corporate sector to assist us with doing that through helping to solve the problems that we face in being able to deliver our own purposes. We want them not to exacerbate the problems that we face as individuals and societies. And in so doing, they do build up that element of being trustworthy that makes it credible for us to have trust in what they're doing. And that trust, as I said, is such an important and yet largely unrecognized asset of business. Because ultimately, trustworthy businesses are commercially successful businesses. And the success of nations around the world depends on the trustworthiness of its business for the prosperity of the many, not just the few, for the future as well as the present. Thank you very much. Thanks, Colin. That was very interesting. Uh, I just wanted to uh, amplify the note you finished up on. Uh, a while ago, um, for several years, I was working at Microsoft, and um, they decided to, after a breach of trust, um, to fundamentally change the way the corporation operated and viewed trust um, with its customers. And um, the internal, internal slogan became Microsoft runs on trust. Uh, it recognized that that was such a key asset uh, to its business going forward. Um, we did some calculations. Um, 
that estimated that the loss to the U.S. tech sector of the Snowden revelations, where it was revealed that U.S. companies were working behind the scenes with the NSA with private data, um, probably cost the cloud computing industry about $30 billion. Um, so the breach of trust can be, as you said, uh, quite significant, but the solution to it isn't uh, actually required rethinking of governance, rethinking of the internal structures, creating new positions. It was really a dramatic overhaul inside the company, um, as you described, it had to go through the whole operations. Uh, but uh, we've got several interesting questions from, from the audience. Just before we move on, perhaps I, I mean, that, that, that is an extremely interesting example. Um, and indeed, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, um, cites the notion of purpose that I've just been describing in terms of solving problems a great deal. Uh, and he has been instrumental in promoting that shift uh, of Microsoft, in particular, the way in which he's done it in relation to addressing one of the elements that, of the problems associated with the cloud and computing more generally, and that is carbon emissions, global warming, et cetera, through the energy uh, that computing uses. And mm. so he has set out a very clear agenda for Microsoft to become carbon zero, not just carbon neutral, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, stage one, stage two parts of its operation, and also to become uh, carbon neutral in relation to its entire supply chain. Uh, and, it's, and he's described precisely the metrics against which it will be possible to evaluate the extent to which it's actually delivering on it. So it is a very good example of what I'm talking about. Thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, indeed. Um, we had internal carbon pricing. Um, if, if I took a flight, um, my unit had to pay for the, 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 the carbon tax, for example. Uh, 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 the revenue from that then bought offsets. Um, yeah, it's a very, very interesting company. Uh, so let me kick off with a question of my own and then we'll go to the panel and then to the audience. Um, so much of our thinking uh, because of who we are, is embedded in, in, and you mentioned a lot, the leading role that was played by the UK. Um, but recently, researchers like Tomar Piketty um, have raised the issue of increasing inequality. Uh, similarly, Joseph Stiglitz in his work, Globalization and its Discontents, uh, raises the specter of increasing inequality due to the modern global corporation. Um, to what extent do you think Anglo-American styles of governance have played a causal role there um, in the rise of inequality globally? And uh, if so, what type of remedies do you think are in place or should be put in place? So yes, I do think that the Anglo-American type model has been a major contributory factor to that uh, in terms of both income inequality that exists within uh, organizations, but also in terms of wealth inequality, um, which in some respects is even more dramatic than income uh, inequality. And the reason why it has created that high level of inequality is that by having that dominant focus on financial performance, it emphasizes essentially a winner's take all. Uh, arrangement by which one competes for the single party that is able to generate the highest returns. Uh, and that much of that uh, winner take all is associated with wealth transfer rather than with wealth creation. That is to say, if you can find someone who can create an minuscule epsilon uh, higher benefit than uh, the next best person, mm. that party will then receive all of the winnings and the second player gains nothing because in terms of the, what one's delivering for one's investors, that uh, winner is in essence the uh, party that's creating the highest benefit for uh, shareholders. So a notion of 
shareholder maximization automatically gives rise to that very high degree of disparity between those who apparently create the highest financial value. But there is, there's more to it than that. And that is what distinguishes in particular Anglo-American uh, systems is not just the emphasis on shareholder returns, but also the emphasis on the delivery of those returns through markets for control. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why the post Milton Friedman period uh, has been associated with an intensification of the shareholder primacy model is that it coincided with a period during which the market for corporate control began to take off first uh, in the UK and the US and then spread to a number of other countries. Uh, and then in the beginning of the, this uh, millennium became associated with the uh, hedge fund activism when it was realized that actually the market for corporate control was not necessary. You didn't necessarily have to have um, hostile takeovers as the way of uh, mm. promoting shareholder interest. You could simply do it by buying a block of shares in companies and then shaking up and shaking out the management by taking on board positions and implementing changes uh, in the management of companies. Now, those two things of hostile takeovers and hedge fund activism have become the drug and fear of boards of companies. Uh, and so the, the notion of promoting shareholder interests above everything else has been really embedded in the boards of companies through the way in which those markets for control have operated. Now, what should be done about it? I should first of all point out that although that notion of inequality has been particularly pronounced in the UK and the US, it's not restricted uh, to those countries because, for example, if one looks at other countries around the world where there is much more of an emphasis on family ownership, for example, uh, in many cases, there is a very high degree of disparity of ownership and control of companies that's also associated with those family businesses. Um, and that really reflects the dominance of the uh, control structures that those families have uh, in their businesses. And so the, the disparity is not simply a consequence of the existence of uh, Anglo-American type markets for control, but it certainly has been exacerbated by it. So in thinking about the solutions, what one needs to do is then to say, well, how does one address this in the context of the variety of different types of capitalist systems that one observes around the world? The solution is not simply to say, well, it's a market for corporate control problem, therefore we should introduce takeover restrictions or uh, allow companies to have poison pills or whatever in the form of takeover defenses. They may have benefits or they may have detriments associated with them, but they don't get to the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem is exactly what I'm talking about here. The motivation of business, the, the, the objective of businesses in terms of what they see themselves as being there to do. And so long as it's the case that businesses perceive themselves to be fundamentally about making money, then in the process of making money, they will impose significant burdens on others, including in terms of the degree of disparity of income and opportunity that exists within organizations and our societies more generally. So one has to get to the heart of the issue in terms of what is the purpose of business and work forward from there. Mm, indeed. Uh, so I'd like to hand it over to Professor O'Neill. Do you have any questions for? Well, in fact, I think um, Professor Palange has a question um, that he wants to ask. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I, I have to say I, I really enjoyed the talk. I found it uh, inspiring and very positive message. So uh, the world is looking brighter. 
Uh, so I have, we have a number of graduate students uh, that are listening to your talk. And, and I guess the, the question, as always, when you're starting on values, governance, research, or research in any area, what advice would you give in terms of thinking about theoretical you know, foundations underpinnings to the research and then uh, advice with respect to data collection and uh, you know, testing? Uh, okay, fine. Very, very good question, Mark. Thank you. Uh, the first bit of advice is I advise uh, students and researchers to persuade their supervisors and teachers that this is a really key area uh, and one that they want to focus on and they want to be supported on in terms of their research agendas going forward. Uh, increasingly, academics are recognizing the importance of this topic but academics are not always the uh, uh, individuals who shift the fastest in terms of their intellectual thinking, uh, because they have a lot of invested capital in terms of the way in which they uh, approach their research questions. So, so there, in some cases, there is that particular hurdle. Now, supposing one has overcome that hurdle, what is actually then uh, the way of implementing research? Well, the first is in terms of recognizing that one of the reasons why this is such an interesting and exciting area to research is not only that it's of immense practical and policy relevance along the lines I've just been describing, but also because it's extremely interdisciplinary. Okay? I, I talked in uh, my presentation about issues relating to law, politics, accounting, finance, sociology, uh, etc it really brings together uh, a whole variety of disciplines across the social sciences. But as I was describing in relation to the British Academy program, in the humanities, in terms of history and philosophy, religious studies, etc., as well as in relation to sociology. So understanding the significance of being able to draw on lots of intellectual frameworks in terms of taking this forward is a key element in terms of uh, really having an effective research agenda. In terms of actual uh, evaluation and measurement and data, et cetera, the data requirements that uh, needed to be undertake research in this area are steadily increasing. Uh, there was a real focus on financial forms of data uh, that really underpinned the re research that was done on shareholder primacy. One of the reasons why shareholder primacy took off was uh, the emergence of what is termed the CRISP data, the Chicago Research into Securities Prices, that were created during the uh, 1970s uh, and allowed people to do an immense amount of research around shareholder returns, shareholder prices, etc., uh, which then seemed to lend an immense degree of scientific rigor uh, to the research that was done in that area. Now, uh, the databases on which one can undertake research around this broader notion of purpose are just beginning to emerge in the form of, for example, these ESG measures, et cetera, and the accounting valuation bases. And that's an area where there's a lot of important work that needs to be done in terms of developing the data sets and then analyzing them. So that is a sphere in which I would urge people really to focus in terms of their research agendas going forward. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Professor Meyer, I, I would like to ask a question before we um, go to um, some questions from our, from our audience. Um, I would like to ask you what challenges you foresee for firm that firms will face in implementing values-based governance when they consider possible trade-offs in satisfying different stakeholders' objectives, especially across nations? Well, okay, thank you, Deirdre. Um, so the, the main impediment that companies currently face in terms of implementation comes not simply from the intellectual paradigm uh, that currently prevails, but from one of the most influential parties in organizations, 
and those are the, their investors. In many cases, the leadership and the boards of companies are very committed to this notion of a purpose that goes beyond financial performance and recognize that it is, of course, critically important. I mean, many uh, leaders of business say, well, you know, it goes without saying uh, that our customers, our employees, our, uh, our, our societies and communities are critical to our ability to be able to create successful businesses and that profit then follows from promoting more interest. But in many cases, they feel seriously impeded in terms of doing that because of the emphasis that institutional investors continue to place on financial performance and the way in which, despite the emergence of things like ESG at the end of the day, for example, a hostile takeover bid or a shareholder activist intervention is driven by financial considerations and share price performance. And institutions will frequently say, well, yes, you know, we, we sympathize with this broader purpose agenda, but what can we do? You know, we're answerable to our beneficiaries, our investors, and our investors expect us to deliver the highest return for their investments. And that's what we are looking for is savers and investing in the Black Rocks and the Vanguards and the Fidelities of this world. So there is a notion that the, the system is essentially stacked against uh, the uh, embedding of purpose. And that's why I'd, when I talked about what's required to uh, shift in this direction, one really has to think in a systematic way across all of the various components of law, et cetera, uh, that are required to align with a broader set of purpose. Now, uh, <clears throat> that notion that investors are a significant impediment uh, is changing rapidly. I mean, I described what Mary Fink said, and there's been a rapid shift in terms of the importance that institutional investors are attaching to ESG initially in relation to the E component, the environmental element, uh, when the political pressures in terms of recognizing the importance of climate change became very significant for institutional investors. What, the, what coronavirus has done has been to emphasize also the importance of the S, the social element, and in particular, obviously, around health. Mm. And what the Black Lives Matters campaign has done has been to further reinforce the significance of the S component as well. So the, the, the pressures that are emerging are shifting the attitudes of investors increasingly in this direction. Now, Milton Friedman in one of his more enlightened uh, statements said that only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change. When that change occurs, the actions that are taken, he said, depend on the ideas that are lying around. It is therefore our duty, he said, uh, to produce new ideas, keep them okay. alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. Now that's absolutely right. That in essence, what we're observing is changing attitudes in response to crises, firstly in relation to the financial crisis and now in relation to uh, the COVID crisis. And what we're going to observe is increasing frequency and intensity of crises until we do fundamentally change uh, the nature of the model. So we will observe progressive shifts in attitude uh, mm. as these crises emerge. The only question is, will we recognize the uh, failure of Milton Friedman's other statement around the sole purpose of business before uh, we encounter uh, more crises of the sort that he's described. Hmm. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to um, put a question from our audience now, and it's from Dr. Nazaruddin Ahmed. And uh, the question is, what is the role of the state 
in the values-based approach? Okay, very good question. And the answer is absolutely critically important because I've talked about the fact that the promotion of corporate purpose uh, has to be thought about in terms of it being profitable for business uh, in de delivering financial value uh, for its investors as well as benefits to society more generally. But it has to be recognized that business cannot solve all problems. One talks about this as being about internalizing externalities. Uh, and there is a certain amount that companies can do in terms of internalizing externalities. But it has to be recognized that there are limitations to that. That, for example, if one thinks about environmental change, climatic changes, then uh, the, the role of government in terms of setting the incentives through tax, taxes and carbon taxes, etc., is critically important. And more generally, the notion of there needing to be a partnership between business and government in terms of solving problems is of primary significance. It's not just that government needs to set the right laws as I was describing in terms of putting purpose at the heart of corporate law, or indeed in terms of regulation, ensuring that regulation is more than just about the rules of the game, but also ensuring an alignment between social purpose and private purpose of business. But it's also about government taking a lead in terms of working with business in terms of solving problems. And what we're observing at present in terms of the coronavirus illustrates that extremely well. Well, we have discovered how much business needs government, but also how much government needs business in terms of solving the problems. Because a lot of the issues around uh, coronavirus are about finding the right solutions to a public health problem. And governments are not, in general, the best institutions for solving major forms of uncertainty. This is what is being termed the notion of radical uncertainty, that we're facing increasing levels of radical uncertainty for which there are known known solutions. And to provide those solutions, one needs to have experimentation, experimentation and innovation. And what the private sector is very good at doing is precisely that, to experiment through having multiple uh, different approaches being taken by different companies competing against each other and innovating in terms of identifying which are the best solutions and the ones that turn out to be the ones that really can be effectively implemented. So the private sector, by its very nature in terms of providing that uh, innovative experimental competition, performs a function that centralized bureaucratic governments are unable to perform. Uh, and so business needs government to provide the frameworks, to provide the coordination between different parties, to provide the financial resources that only a tax-based monetary creation system can offer, and that even uh, the most enlightened private investors and institutional investors are unable to to fund. So business really needs government to provide all of that, but government also needs business to provide the solutions. Um, thank you. Thank you for that answer. I'm going to move on to another question from Meredith Edelman. Mm -hmm. And Meredith has said, companies asserting a purpose that is something other than profit is a nice thought, but it seems that these initiatives will fall flat unless the more pro-social purposes are built into the very structure of the organisations. In order to be trustworthy, there needs to be not just nice words and platitudes or even charitable actions, but inclusion of stakeholders in decision-making processes. Yet companies seem to resist initiatives that require seats on the board of directors be reserved for stakeholders, like employees, 
customers and others who interact with companies. Can you speak to how companies are involving stakeholders in decision-making processes? Yes, so this question about uh, accountability of directors and who should have oversight and uh, control of decisions taken in companies is a critically important one. And the issue about the extent to which there should be stakeholder involvement in governance is one that has been much debated over a long period of time. In particular, there is a view that, as I was mentioning, that one of the, if not the most important stakeholder in a company, the employee, and that employee representation in terms of the governance of companies uh, is a key requirement in terms of the effective embedding uh, of purpose in organizations. So we're, we're observing many initiatives along those lines in terms of uh, the inclusion of employee representation on boards. Now, this has obviously been a feature of many corporate governance systems around the world for a long period of time, in particular in Central Europe, the notion of having two-tier boards with a supervisory board that comprises equal representation from employees, from workers, as well as from shareholders, uh, has existed basically since the modern corporation was established in, for example, Germany and Austria. Uh, elsewhere, it's reflected in the notion of there being forums and councils uh, of uh, employee representatives and some of the most successful companies in the world are ones that have very effectively embedded that notion of having employee participation in the governance of companies. One in the UK that is frequently uh, referred to is the John Lewis Partnership, which is a retail company, uh, which was established on the basis of a, a trust for the employees. So it's another example, essentially, of a foundation-owned company where the, the company is owned for the benefit of its employees and where there is a council that in, um, uh, has uh, oversight from the employees in the organization and an active participation of the employees uh, in the governance of the firm. Now, more generally, we're observing increasing interest in the notion of, of uh, employee-owned companies uh, and that employee ownership is an alternative to both uh, traditional shareholder-owned firms and also to the industrial foundation-owned firms. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that they may have considerable merits in terms of their performance over other types of organizations. In particular, there's been growing interest in the notion of employee trust uh, companies. That is to say that uh, it's not so much that employees own companies, but there's a trust that owns the company on behalf of the employees and the John Lewis partnership is in essence an illustration of that type trust and the advantage that has over simply employee ownership is that employee owned firms can be as short term in their focus as shareholder uh, owned companies and so far as it's the current generation of employees that run the company and they're interested in their uh, performance rather than necessarily in the interest of future generations of employees. The advantage that an employee trust has is that the trust is responsible on an intergenerational basis for the interests of employees, not just for the current generation. Now, now all of those are illustrations of alternative forms of governance that reflect participation and the interests of a variety of different stakeholders. What I think is critically important is to recognize that there isn't a right answer to this. That just as the view that uh, shareholder primacy was the right solution to corporate governance a few years ago and has proven to be not 
a correct approach and is too restrictive and too narrow in terms of the way in which it views the governance of the firm. One shouldn't presume that there is a right form of governance that should be universally applicable. What the whole notion of purpose promotes is the idea of diversity, that one's trying to encourage a diversity of objectives and purposes of companies. And those different objectives and purposes need different structures of firms, including different forms of governance that are best suited to uh, embedding their purposes in their organizations. So one, instead of sh trying to prescribe particular types of governance arrangements, one should recognize the importance of plurality and a multiplicity of forms of governance arrangements and encourage as much plurality as possible. Because in essence, what one wants to do is to create competition, a competition not in the traditional sense of a competition in terms of promoting financial performance, but a competition in a run to the top in terms of purposeful companies that really do deliver the best uh, outcomes for solving problems. Um, and that competition should involve a competition between a variety of different types of governance arrangements that are uh, potentially going to deliver those outcomes. Thank you very much for answering all our questions today. I'm now going to hand over to Professor Wilkie. Thanks, Deidre. Uh, so we're out of time. This has been brilliant. There's still a couple of good questions um, uh, in the backlog, but uh, we're at the end of the Zoom session. So I just want to, uh, on behalf of Monash University, on behalf of Monash Business School, uh, thank him for he, Professor Colin Mayer for his time. This has been a very interesting, insightful talk. I've certainly learned a lot. Uh, I want to thank uh, Professor O'Neill and Provost Mark Belange for, for the generosity of their time. I think this has been a valuable experience for everybody. And um, onwards and upwards. Cheers. Thank you very much to all of you. I very much enjoyed doing this. Thank you.